Here's our hero, Ray Shnazzy. Um, so I just want to tell you, the, the, the um, racemic mixture of 3TC is what I had access to. It was actually Ray Shinazi who had the insight and the brilliance to know that the enantiomers had to be separated because one of them was probably toxic, which indeed turned out to be the case. And Ray uh, purified the minus enantiomer, which is indeed the drug that we now call 3TC. Um, Ray, of course, also came up with the idea of FTC, which involved uh, putting a fluorine onto 3TC. And in one memorable um, question that was posed to me by an attorney uh, in a patent case on one occasion, uh, I was asked, well, Dr. Weinberg, don't you think it was obvious to put fluorine onto 3TC and that would come up with uh, another structure that could potentially have antiviral activity? And my answer was, well, if it was so obvious, how come the company that had access to this drug before anybody else didn't do it themselves? Why did they wait for Raymond Shinazi and Dennis Theoda to come up with this idea and indeed to carry out that exact uh, modification of 3TC? So there you go. I think it was entirely original. Uh, here's Ray together with a whole litany of compounds uh, that he has uh, either led the efforts toward or shared responsibility in regard to development of, and I can think of no one else uh, really more deserving than Ray himself of, of a Gertrude Elliott Award. Um, maybe next time, Ray. Uh, this is Bernard Bello, who indeed was a brilliant McGill chemist over many years who did synthesize that racemic mixture and um, also had had a very distinguished career in organic chemistry prior um, to having entered the nucleoside field. Very tragically, he was uh, a three-pack-a-day smoker back then in, in the 80s, and he died of a heart attack in his car behind the wheel at the age of 65. Here he is again. Uh, here's Dr. Mitsuya, another uh, great star in the field of HIV drug development. He's brought us some outstanding compounds, uh, Darunavir being one of them, of, of course, probably our best protease inhibitor. He's going to talk to us uh, later about newer and better protease inhibitors. And, and of course, EFDA is uh, one of his babies, and we're going to hear about that uh, in greater detail as well. Uh, here's Sam Broder, whom we all know. Um, here's another picture of Sam. Um, looking very um, cherubic, uh, who of course shares in the responsibility together with Mitch uh, and, and, and Bob Yarshwin for the development uh, of uh, Zydovidine. Uh, Eric de Klerk, uh, someone else, a uh, great scientist who um, has, shares responsibility uh, with Dr. Holy uh, for the development and advocacy of tenofovir. Um, and of course, soon we'll be talking more and more about TAF uh, as an extremely relevant product. Um, so another pro-drug of tenofovir that seems to function in admirable style. Now before I go on with some scientific slides, I, I just want to tell you that I have made a career out of always being second. You know, really, I've been second to do a lot of stuff. Um, for example, our lab was the second in the world to publish a paper on HIV drug resistance after the famous paper in Science by um, Brendan Larder and, and, and uh, Richmond and Darby. Um, I think we've probably been second in regard to a lot of other things as well. So I do want to take a little bit of time to hopefully describe a situation whereby ultimately we'll be given credit for having been first at something. And, and who knows, we'll, we'll see. For example, I introduced Ray Shinazi about um, two months ago at, at a, lab in, in, uh, a lab meeting in Baltimore, the Gallo meeting, um, and I, I mentioned that we uh, had just purified the polymerase enzyme of Zika virus and had some hits that, that really block the, the replication of, of the virus and that we hope to be able to crystallize it, to which Ray said to me, it's already been done. So, so um, maybe, the, I, I know that's true. It's already been done, and there are a number of papers that are probably going to come out very soon on, on the crystal structure of, of Zika polymerase. At any rate, uh, dolutegravir is, without question, I, I think, the best approved drug that we now have in the armamentarium. 
I think we're going to see others coming forward very soon that are perhaps even going to be better. But right now, if we only talk about approved drugs, this is an exceptional product. Um, and, you know, if you were uh, the people at, at Vive Healthcare who, who sell and market this drug, um, you would really probably not want everybody in, in the room to know that the major people who came up with this structure uh, were scientists at a Japanese company called Shinogi Pharmaceuticals. Um, but we were fortunate enough to be given this drug um, by Vive and to, I guess, be the first to try to select for resistance against it after uh, others, perhaps at the companies, had, had not been able to do so. So we were um, able to describe a 263K mutation in the integrase uh, coding region uh, that conferred minimal resistance, and that mutation was followed by one at position 51. Now, I think you all know that dolutegravir, uh, in a head-to-head -head randomized clinical trial, um, was shown to be superior to a tripla, which, of course, is the triple combination of efavirenz together with FTC um, and tenofovir, uh, and this was a statistically significant difference. Um, and I think this slide underlines a, a, a few points. First, as we know, the integrase inhibitors act faster than any other drug class to reduce viral load. I think that's very important. Second, um, there has been no reputable case documented until now in the literature of anybody getting resistance against uh, dolutegravir in, in, in the clinic. Now, I'm not only talking about the context of clinical trials. I'm talking about patients who live in inner city Washington, D.C. I'm talking about people who live in the South Bronx. In other words, some of the poorest people in the United States and elsewhere, and there has not been a single documentation of resistance against dolutegravir when it, when it has been used in first-line therapy, and that, that is unprecedented. So we have to try to understand why that is. Um, by the way, this slide only shows 48-week data, but in, in fact, these data were continued out to three years um, with the same kinds of, of results, although the rates of success did go down over time, probably because of non-adherence. Um, now, there was a clinical trial that was carried out and published in The Lancet by Pedro Kahn and colleagues, and it, it was called um, the Sailing Study. And in this study, um, what they did was compare dolutegravir against raltegravir in people who had previously taken and failed other drugs, but who had never before themselves been on an integrase inhibitor. So in other words, these people were compromised in regard to optimized background, they were taking an integrase inhibitor for the first time, and what happened is that a few of them in the dolutegravir arm actually developed that same mutation at position R263K that we had earlier selected for in, in tissue culture and shown to confer very low level resistance against this drug. Now, remarkably, those patients who failed dolutegravir in the context of that first line integrase inhibitor exposure did not rebound with high viral loads. Their viral loads plateaued at around 1,000 to 2,000. They never went back up to 500,000 or 600,000. So again, the drug seemed to be able to keep working in spite of the fact that that mutation was there. And our hypothesis has been now for some years and still is that viruses that contain the R263K mutation, which is the first one that's selected, and the H51Y mutation, which is selected thereafter by dolutegravir, are so impacted in regard to fitness that these viruses simply cannot grow out in patients, bearing in mind also that patients, of course, have an immune response, and if the virus can't multiply very well, maybe that viral antigenic target remains much more durable and therefore much more susceptible in a long-term fashion um, to antiviral immune responsiveness. And, and in fact, that is a subject that our laboratory is pursuing very, very um, intensely as we speak. Um, so this is the first mutation, very low-level resistance. And this, this slide 
kind of summarizes in schematic form what we think is going on. So you, you all know this. A wild type virus grows very fast, and then any single mutation that is associated with drug resistance usually does have some impact on the ability of the virus to continue to propagate. And in the context of this discussion, 263K impacts viral replication capacity and integrase enzymatic activity by probably around 20 to 30 percent. So too does the most common initial mutation that is associated with raltegravir and elvitegravir, that being Q148H. And then what happens most commonly in the context of drugs like raltegravir, you wind up getting a second mutation very commonly at position 140S, and you see that in the second line from the top. And that second mutation does two things simultaneously. First, it very definitely elevates the level of drug resistance against raltegravir or elvitegravir to perhaps 50 to 100 fold in some cases, perhaps making those drugs non-usable in terms of therapeutic benefit. But secondarily, there is a restoration of viral replication capacity. In other words, that second mutation is a compensatory mutation. In contrast, and you see this illustrated at the bottom of the slide, with dolutegravir, the second mutation at position 51 is not a compensatory mutation. What it does is further diminish levels of viral replication capacity as well as diminish levels of integrase enzymatic activity, which of course can be demonstrated using purified integrase and recombinant viruses. So here you see on this slide how 263K in an integrase strand transfer assay in fact does diminish levels of, um, of, of integrase activity. And, and by the way, I want to uh, go out of my way to thank uh, Daria Hazuda and Jay Grobler and their team at Merck for teaching us how to do integrase uh, enzymatic assays at, at a time that the Merck labs uh, in regard to infectious disease and virology were located in Montreal. So it was an easy thing and they were extremely generous. Uh, and here you see in this slide how adding the second mutation to the first further decreases integrase strand transfer activity and, and 3' prime synthetase activity going down to the bottom. So this is really something we had not seen before in, in, in our field, how a second mutation, in fact, could further undercut the ability of the virus to replicate, presumably because it's undercutting the ability of the enzyme to function. And, and here is a replication assay, and you can see again the two mutations, the double mutant growing the poorest. And, and we've tried to model this based on um, what we know about the integrase uh, crystal structure of, of the foamy virus um, and have shown that this seems to be somewhat consistent. But the, one of the main points is, is that there have been no compensatory mutations in regard to dolutegravir resistance and viral fitness in first-line therapy that have been seen over more than five years in tissue culture now. So where, where are we going with this, and, 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 and what does it mean? So I think at the very least, a drug that does not easily select for drug resistance should be intolerant of ongoing HIV transmission as long as patients remain adherent to therapy. And we know that dolutegravir is to all intents and purposes not a perfect drug in terms of its toxicity profile, but it, it's, it's pretty darn good. So, you know what, I think that this concept called treatment as prevention, which is really a great concept, right? We, we want to treat everybody in the world, and, you know, our good friend Julio Montaner has been, you know, the strongest proponent of, of this, this idea in the world, I think. Treat everyone in the world who has HIV. Let's get everybody to have a viral load that's undetectable. And once they have undetectable viral loads, then, of course, they're not going to be able to transmit the virus any longer. And therefore, we're going to end the epidemic, not as we all want, by finding a cure necessarily, but instead by dealing with a situation from a public health and epidemiological standpoint. And this, too, is going to represent a means of ending the epidemic. So I, I think we're not going to get there using that route unless we, in fact, use the best drugs in the world to treat everybody in the world 
And sadly, as we speak, and Rowena made mention of this, 2000 was a very different situation in regard to HIV therapeutics worldwide. In 2000, there were only 7,000 people in all of Africa out of a total of more than 8 million infected people who had access to triple antiretroviral therapy. 7,000 out of more than 8 million. Today, that number has burgeoned. But what has also burgeoned in the context of the African continent, and there have been numerous papers on this topic lately, is the numbers of cases of HIV drug resistance and what is the major culprit, which drug is the major culprit in regard to all of this drug resistance that we are now finding in Africa? It's efavirenz. It's efavirenz which is the mainstay of a tripla. And quite simply, if we keep using drugs like efavirenz in developing country settings, because efavirenz is, as we know, a pretty toxic drug, although for sure, it was the gold standard together with FTC and tenofovir over many years and it kept millions of people alive and that's a great thing. But right now as we speak, it's selecting for many, many thousands of cases of drug resistance in developing country settings. And that means that the people who develop resistance to efavirenz and unfortunately the mutations associated with efavirenz drug resistance do not impact very much on replicative fitness, so these viruses can easily be transmitted. It means that there are going to be many, many people who acquire uh, these viruses through sexual relations and will have very definitely reduced chances at responding to therapy. So you've probably read this while I've been blabbing on. Um, so resistance against dolutegravir has never been reported in, in, in first-line therapy, even under conditions that are really commensurate with those that we find in some of the poorest places in the world. And I'm also talking, by the way, about people who are HCV co-infected, um, so that's qu quite remarkable. And not only that, but the, 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 the other drugs with which dolutegravir has been co-utilized um, also do not develop resistance when they're used together with dolutegravir. So I, I, I just can't say more about this. Uh, I think dolutegravir um, should be, right now, a, as an approved drug, a product that is used everywhere in the world uh, in, in first-line therapy. And we unfortunately still live in two very different worlds. That's the truth. Um, so we have not yet come that, that far. Okay, oops. Can I go back one? There we go. So wh what about other drugs? So, you know, on the right lower portion of this slide, you see the Gilead product, Bictegravir. Uh, you see also the structures of Raltegravir and Elvitegravir. And I want you to look at these structures at the bottom very closely. And you can see they look pretty uh, similar, don't they? Um, in fact, there were a couple of modifications. You, you can see on the extreme left-hand side of Bictegravir, there is a different grouping. You can also see that there is an additional fluorine um, on, on the pentose ring on the right-hand side. Um, so the drugs are not identical, but they're similar. Um, will there be uh, issues of uh, intellectual property? Uh, I don't know, but you know what? Patent lawyers have to make money too. <laughs> okay, oops, I went too fast. So I, I wanted to talk just briefly about EFDA, which I think is a great drug. Um, I think it's more than a great drug, I think it's a fantastic drug. And I really hope that um, it, it's going to represent an, a, a, an essential product in our armamentarium going forward. I, I just want to describe very briefly to you something that we did in our lab after we were fortunate to get EFDA um, from Jay Grobler and, and his team at Merck. Some of you may recall that a few years ago we had done studies on ropivirine. And ropivirine, you'll recall, is really a great NNRTI. Um, but in the clinical trials that were done with ropivirine that led to its approval, um, patients who began therapy with very high viral loads and took ropivirine together mostly um, with Truvada, um, another R Raymond product, um, so those patients actually developed two different mutations. They developed a mutation at position E138K in reverse transcriptase, and they also developed the M184V or M184I mutation 
that is associated with FTC and 3TC. So Dan Koritskis and I essentially had exactly the same idea at the same time. Why is this? How can this be? And we did studies and showed that, in fact, 184V could be compensated in, re in regard to reduced replicate of fitness by the E138K mutation in reverse transcriptase. And this was published a few years ago. And uh, it, it was, in fact, a very satisfying answer to the question as to why uh, these two mutations arose in tandem in the ropivirine clinical trials. So EFDA, as we know, is a drug that selects for the M184V mutation. It was logical to me to ask the question, hey, this drug really looks great. It could only potentially have one Achilles heel. And maybe that's going to be E138K. Will it select for E138K as a compensatory mutation? Now we're going to have a virus that grows very fast, and this drug in that context might be in trouble. You know what? I'm happy to tell you. Look at the left side of the slide. That does not seem to be the case. There might be a little bit more resistance, but let me tell you, this drug keeps working very, very well against the viruses that have the combination of E138K together with M184I or 184V. Um, as I said, yeah, there's a bit more resistance, but it's really, really not very high level, and certainly the drug uh, is, is still working very well. So I'm, I'm very encouraged. All right, now, you know, I'm very, against mono, I'm very against monotherapy, but we did some monotherapy studies in monkeys. Uh, so I did this together with Kuhn von Rampe. He provided the monkeys, I provided the dolutegravir. And in fairness, some of the analysis of the work was done uh, by Jeff Lifson and, and his group, uh, Brandon Keel, um, at, at the Frederick uh, uh, facility of the National Cancer Institute. Um, so we, we didn't have a lot of money. I just want to show you that monotherapy reduced viral load uh, by about a hundredfold in one animal, and that was pretty durable. Um, but the other animal, in, in fact, responded very well um, and, and did so in a sustainable way. Um, so I'm still against monotherapy. Um, the animal that didn't respond well did have resistance mutations, um, and um, the resistance mutations that have been seen in this context, as well as in um, other studies uh, performed in uh, humanized mice, in, in, in um, concert with uh, Robert Redfield and Alonso Heredia, um, have mostly been the raltegravir mutations. Now, you know, Pedro Kahn, again, has done this study called PADDLE, where he's using just 3TC together uh, with dolutegravir, and he's not getting any resistance mutations at all in, in patients out to 48 weeks. The combination seems to be working well. Um, so that's great. Here is our study again, the two monkeys um, there are more, by the way, that are currently being followed. Um, so one animal, uh, you know, uh, did very well, uh, the other not so well. Um, I just want to point out, because people always come up to me and say, Mark, you know, PIs don't generate resistance either. You don't get resistance to darunavir in first-line therapy. Well, you don't get resistance very much in the protease region. But what about mutations at cleavage sites and elsewhere within GAG? This has been well documented, and we never routinely screen for those kinds of mutations in clinical practice. Uh, I think more importantly, perhaps, is that sometimes when patients generate resistance to darunavir and, and adazanavir and other PIs, they do get resistance to 3TC and FTC. They do have the 184V and I mutations. So, I think I've taken you through a, a litany of stuff. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank all the people in our lab and Kun von Rampe um, for having participated in uh, some, some of this work. Um, and I want to thank the granting agencies who don't seem to have made it onto the slide. Um, so that's it. I hope that, at the very least, the concept of having drugs against which resistance doesn't happen in first-line therapy will stick. I hope that the same concept will apply to Bictegravir, which I think is very likely. And I hope that the same concept will apply to EFDA, which I think is also very likely. And then, and finally, 
I think that we ought to be smart enough as scientists to figure out strategies that will use the concept of non-development of resistance against new drugs in first-line therapy as one that will help us to our ultimate goal of achieving a cure, at least a functional cure, of HIV infection. I think there are a lot of smart people in this world and elsewhere, and I think we ought to say to ourselves, hey, if we can have drugs that work so well and for so long, how can we translate that knowledge to benefiting the field in a much more meaningful way than just another antiretroviral drug? Thank you. Thank you.